Hi, welcome back. Now we're going to talk about term structure and yield curves and exactly what the heck those are. Uh, so what I'm going to do is I'm going to introduce the exact definition of term structure and then talk about why the yield curve is so important. And then we'll talk about exactly what determinants actually make up interest rates. And then finally, we will uh, do some estimation of bond yields over certain periods based on our yield curve uh, calculations. All right, so let's get started. Uh, when we talk about the components that make up an interest rate, or rather, what risks affect an interest rate, there's a couple of primary risks. So when we calculate an interest rate, or in this case, we'll refer to, re refer to it as a return, uh, there's first off, we have a real risk-free rate. So that is the real rate on a one-year treasury bill, or it could also be the, one, the yield on a one-month treasury bill. Uh, usually we say that the real risk-free rate is the lowest interest rate that we can get in the overall economy after we control for inflation. Now, the next factor that we have going into returns or interest rates uh, is the inflation premium. So our inflation premium is just the portion of an interest rate that is comprised of the, uh, the risk associated with inflation. So investors, when they're investing, they take into account the effect of inflation. Well, how do they do that? Well, they probably add a couple of basis points or maybe even a couple of percentage points to the interest rate that they require on their investment in order to make that investment. So the way we control for that is by calculating an inflation premium. Now, this R star indicating our real risk-free rate and this IP indicating our inflation premium, the combination of those is sometimes referred to as the nominal risk-free rate. And our nominal risk-free rate, this is not the last time you're gonna see that. Uh, we'll talk about it when we get to the capital asset pricing model. Uh, I, I will say that just to lead that discussion, our nominal risk-free rate in our overall economy is often seen as the one-month T-bill or the one-year Treasury bill. Uh, so we'll come back to that eventually in this course. Now, whether ha we, we also have a number of other risks affecting our interest rates or returns. We have, first, liquidity premiums. Now, a liquidity premium, as our nice definition here says, is a premium that's added to the rate on a security if that security cannot be converted to cash on a short notice at a price that is close to the original cost. Well, what does that mean? Essentially, there's a cost to investing in illiquid assets. In other words, investors, when they're deciding to invest, they're going to consider how quickly and at what cost they can get out of an investment. If it's very costly to sell off their shares of stock or let's say to sell off their bonds very quickly, let's say they have to take a haircut on the, the price that they are trying to sell a particular asset for in order to get out of that investment, uh, they're going to likely apply a liquidity premium to the interest rate that they are demanding. Uh, so let's say that you're considering investing in uh, two bonds and one of them you can sell very quickly because everyone wants to own this bond. The other bond is extremely illiquid, meaning that if you wanna sell that bond, you might have to wait six months in order to sell it. Well, because that second bond is, as we say, illiquid, you might, if you wanna sell that bond very quickly, you might have to sell it at, let's say, a 10% discount. So this is something that is factored into interest rates and also returns in the broader economy. Uh, so typically we say that the less liquid an asset is, the higher the interest rate or the higher return, the, the return demanded by investors before they actually invest in that asset. The next factor we have to consider is the maturity risk premium. And the maturity risk premium, this is called a couple of other things by investors, but your book refers to it as the maturity risk premium, so let's go with it. Uh, this, as defined by your book, is a premium that reflects interest rate risk. And bonds with longer maturities have greater interest rate risk. Why is this important? 
Well, if you're considering investing in two assets, one of them matures very soon, let's say in six months, and the other matures in 20 years, that investment that is extremely short term, let's say it's that six month uh, time to maturity, that investment is gonna be affected by interest rates far less than the second investment is. So let's say that interest rates significantly decrease a year from now. And the value of that asset, let's say, well, let's say the interest rates increase tremendously. If we're talking about a bond, as you'll see in a couple of weeks, uh, typically the value of that bond is going to fall when, the, when interest rates rise. So longer term assets are typically associated with greater maturity risk. Now, I realize I'm not really giving you a good example, so why don't I go ahead and provide you a very quick example of what I mean uh, with regard to maturity risk. So what I've gone ahead and done is I've created an example in Excel. In this example, I've set a specific interest rate, let's say 5%, and I've created two assets. One of them is, well, they're both bonds. We'll call these bond one and bond two. And each of these bonds has a different time to maturity. Bond one matures in five years, and bond two matures in 10 years. Now, if I wanna illustrate the maturity risk premium here, all I have to do is calculate the price of each of these bonds as I adjust interest rates. So we'll talk about how, how we actually, or how the change in interest rates actually affects bond prices in a later chapter, but I'm showing you this now in some small sense, just, to, just so you can get a sense of why we care so much about the time to maturity of assets. So if I were to adjust this interest rate from 5% so let's say 6%, what you're gonna see is that the present value of these bonds is going to change immediately. Uh, so they're both going to fall. So let's go ahead and do that. I'll change that 5% to 6%. And what you can see is that the present value of each of these bonds fell. Now I've already saved that information. The present value of bond one and bond two when the interest rate is 5% and the present value of bond one and bond two when the interest rate is 6%. What you can see is that when the interest rate increases by 1%, the present value of bond one, which is of shorter term maturity, decreases by about 4.44%. However, the present value of bond two decreases by about 8.56%. Why is that? Well, it's because you're discounting the cash flows of bond two over a longer period of time. There's more compound interest occurring here. You're discounting over a longer period of time, and so that compound interest has a longer time period at, over which to work. So what I'm trying to say here, what I'm really trying to show you here is that assets that have a longer time to maturity are going to be far more affected by interest rate risk, or rather, the change in interest rates is going to, to affect those long-term assets far more than it would affect in, uh, short-term assets or assets that have a short time to maturity, say five years. I guess that's not really that uh, short, but shorter than the other one. All right, let's get back to the final determinant of interest rate risk, uh, of interest rates that I have listed here, default risk. So. Typically, when investors determine the interest rate that they they're going to demand before they lend out money, default risk plays a crucial role in this, this decision. You might ask why, although hopefully you, you probably have guessed at the answer. Uh, if you are deciding to invest in a particular asset, the possibility that you might not get back the exactly what you're owed is going to be a bit of a concern to you. So if you're considering investing in, let's say, uh, the bonds of Sears, which has already defaulted on its obligations to its bondholders, or let's say uh, the, the bonds of Tesla, which is very close to bankruptcy. Uh, if you're considering investing in those bonds, uh, 
you might demand an additional compensation. And that additional compensation comes in the form of our default risk premium. The greater the likelihood of default of the issuing party, the greater the compensation you as an investor should demand from that issuing party before you buy their bonds. So that's it. Now, there are a couple of definitions that we need to talk about now that we've talked about uh, what goes into or what factors play a role in interest rates. Uh, the first definition I need to cover is what's called term structure. And term structure is our relationship between time to maturity and interest rates. So what we typically do once we know the interest rates of various assets is we can look at how those interest rates change as the time to maturity changes. Now, the way we typically look at term structure is through a, a, I guess we could call it a graph called our yield curve. And the yield curve is nothing more than a graphical representation of term structure. The way we typically graph it is we plot the interest rate of bonds with various times to maturity on really just a, a, two, a two dimensional graph. Now, I'll show you that yield curve in a second, but I want to first mention that we have really two types of yield curves out there, or two looks of these yield curves. We have what's called a normal yield curve, which is upward sloping, and this is a yield curve that you're gonna see most of the time. The other yield curve that we typically have is the inverted or downward sloping yield curve. Now, these yield curves occur at different points in time. Like I said, most of the time we're gonna see a normal or, uh, or upward sloping yield curve. This indicates that bonds that have a, lar a longer time to maturity are going to come with higher interest rates. Uh, you might ask why, well, I'll get into that in a second. Uh, inverted yield curves are typically seen far less frequently. Typically when we see an inverted yield curve, that indicates that we are either in a recession or very close to a recession. All right, so let's see an example of first a normal yield curve. Now here we have just a very basic graphical representation of what a normal yield curve might look like. Uh, so in it, we've got a couple of components. So we've graphed the time to maturity on the x-axis and the interest rate for various bonds on the y-axis. Now, in the real world, Typically what you'll see is nothing more than this, this top line with the arrow on it. Now, our yield curve indicates that our, well, what I have here indicates that our interest rates are comprised of a couple of components. The way we typically view yield curves is by taking a look at U.S. Treasuries, so the debt of the U.S. federal government at various uh, maturities, so a one-month treasury, a uh, three-month treasury, a six-month treasury, one-year, three-year, five-year, 10-year, and 30-year. So what we do is we typically plot these maturities on this graph that I have right here. Now, because U.S. treasuries are typically seen as uh, default risk-free, we don't include the default risk premium on the, on the yield curve. Uh, we also typically don't include the liquidity risk premium. Uh, the reason for that is that U.S. Treasuries are seen as some of the most liquid assets in the entire economy. So typically we just assume that there's, there's no liquidity, pre or I guess I should say illiquidity premium. So what we're left with is our interest rate risk premium, a.k.a. our market risk premium, and or I guess I should say our maturity risk premium. Uh, and then we also have our inflation premium. And then finally, we have the real interest rate, that R star that I showed you a couple of seconds ago. Now, a real interest rate doesn't change for any, I mean, regardless of the time to maturity of the bond. The real interest rate is just what you can get on a bond after you control for inflation and our interest rate risk premium. Now, that's going to be consistent for bonds of every maturity, but we also have inflation premiums. And the inflation premium is, like I said, that compensation to investors 
in the case that inflation is high in the future. So if investors are considering buying bonds that have a longer time to maturity, hopefully they're considering the possibility that inflation could be uh, higher in the future, or we'll just say high in the future. And so they demand additional compensation for investing in longer term bonds. Now, the maturity risk premium, AKA the interest rate risk premium, uh, that typically is increasing in the time to maturity. So the longer the time to maturity, the higher the market risk premium. The reason, uh, sorry, the maturity risk premium. Don't get that definition mis mixed, mixed up. Eh. Okay, so what you can see here is that our maturity risk premium, aka our interest, risk pr interest rate risk premium is increasing in our time to maturity. Why is that? Well, it's because investors are facing greater interest rate risk. In other words, the longer the time to maturity, the greater the effect of changes in interest rates on the value of these assets or whatever asset is being held here by investors. So in this case, because this is a yield curve, the assets being held by investors are U.S. Treasury bonds, U.S. T-bills, U.S. T-notes, and U.S. T-bonds. Uh, so interest rate risk is going to affect these longer term bonds to a much greater extent than it would affect, say, a one month T-bill. And I did just show you how that works in that Excel uh, spreadsheet a few seconds ago. Now let's talk about the inverted yield curve. Now the inverted yield curve or downward sloping uh, yield curve indicates what happens when investors have a very low opinion on future inf uh, inflation. So if investors believe that inflation is going to be quite low in the future, uh, and there's a couple of reasons why they might suspect that, then they might be willing to pay a lower, or they might be willing to receive a lower interest rate in the future than in the present time. So on, let's say, a one-month T-bill, or a three-month T-bill, or a six-month T-bill. You might ask, why would investors expect a lower inflation premium during, let's say, recessions when we typically see these investment, these inverted yield curves? Well, it's because typically during recessionary periods, there's less demand in the overall economy for goods and services. So the pressure on companies to push their, their prices up and up and up and up is a little less. So this is why we typically see uh, lower inflation premiums uh, during recessions. All right, now I've shown you two different types of yield curves, the, uh, the normal yield curve and the inverted yield curve. So you might have the question, why do yield curves differ? Why do we see different shapes over different time periods? Well, it's really because there's a lot of different factors playing, in, uh, playing a role in determining interest rates or yields on these, uh, on these bonds. Uh, I suppose I've given you a couple of these already. Now, I think it's probably a good idea for me to show you some actual yield curves just so you can get a sense what these look like in the real world. So what I have here are four examples of actual yield curves. So our first example is the yield curve as of January 2006. So you can see here it's pretty flat. The interest rate on the one month T-bill is about four point, I will say that that's 4.15% or we'll say 4.2%. It's extremely close to our yield to maturity or interest rate on the 10 year and the 30 year T, uh, the T bond. Uh, so the annual interest rate on our 30 year T bond is about four point, we'll say that's 4.4 or 4.5%. Uh, so here, this would indicate that investors are not really that optimistic or bullish on the future, ex uh, on future market conditions. Uh, like I said, typically we see inverted yield curves when there are negative expectations of future economic performance, but really we only see a couple of maturities here where we actually have uh, different, uh, a negative difference between a shorter term maturity bond and a longer term maturity bond. So you can see this dip here. Uh, this would be a bit concerning to investors. Uh, it might indicate that 
investors as a whole believe that there are some rough economic patches ahead. Now, let's compare that to December 2012. So in December 2012, our yield curve looked like this. It was absolutely a normal yield curve. So we see this positive or upward sloping trend. Now, you might ask, why is the interest rate so low for these short-term maturity bonds? So this one-month T-bill and the three-month T-bill. Well, the answer is, uh, well, the Federal Reserve had lowered interest rates, especially for these short-term maturity T-bills. Now, what this, tr what this yield curve indicates is that investors believe that inflation is going to be much higher in the future, say, especially after about five or six years from now, and now being December 2012. Uh, so this would indicate to us as investors that future economic conditions are expected to be pretty good. Now let's compare that to September 11th, 2000. Now, I realize some of you might not have been alive as of September 11th, 2000. Well, I, I can say from personal experience that what you're looking at right here is our yield curve around the time of the dot-com bursting, uh, the dot-com bubble bursting. Uh, so that's a phenomenon where the, the tech bubble actually popped and we saw large negative returns on the stock market. Uh, so what we have here indicates an inverted yield curve. Essentially, the interest rate on these short-term maturity bonds is higher than the interest rate on these longer-term uh, maturity bonds. So this indicates that investors are relatively bearish on the future state of the economy. If we're looking at this as an investor in this time period, let's say September 11th, 2000, we might be very worried about the future economic conditions of the overall economy. Lastly, we have October 4th, 1989, and we see this very, very odd hump-shaped yield curve. You don't see this one that often. And this indicates that investors are a bit uncertain about future economic conditions. Uh, now, you don't, we really don't talk about these hump-shaped uh, yield curves all that often just because it's, it's a bit more difficult to justify exactly why they exist. Uh, but I will say this hump-shaped yield, yield curve that occurred on October 4th, 1989, uh, this was the yield curve just prior to the uh, sell-off of, of junk bonds. So there was actually a uh, period during which a uh, huge amount of junk bonds or below investment grade bonds were, uh, were being traded in the 1980s. Now, a few days after this date, October 4th, was October 13th, 1989, which is sometimes referred to as uh, Black, uh, Black Friday. Uh, so the reason that's significant is because there was a massive sell-off, a massive one-day sell-off of stocks on that, that Friday. Uh, I believe the, the actual... Uh, return on the overall stock, stock market, uh, particularly the, the New York Stock Exchange, uh, that, that one fell by at least 5 or 10 percent. Uh, so what this, this last yield curve indicates is that uh, investors are a bit uncertain about future economic conditions, and sometimes uh, this, this makes for very volatile future economic conditions as investors uh, either buy up large amounts of shares and we see very large positive returns or we see very large negative returns. Uh, so that's all I have to say about that one. All right, so let's talk about the first theory that we have for why the yield curve looks the way it does. The first theory we have is something called liquidity preference theory. And this theory says that longer term bonds normally yield more than short term bonds because the maturity risk premium increases with time to maturity. So I've already give you a half-hearted definition or explanation for why this is, but let's talk about it again. Essentially, this theory says that if you are deciding whether to invest as a bond investor in either a short-term maturity asset, like a six-month time to maturity bond versus a 10-year time to maturity bond, typically 
you're going to require some additional compensation to invest in that long-term bond. Why? Well, it's because you face greater interest rate risk associated with that long-term bond than that short-term bond. In other words, compound interest is affecting the price of this bond or the value of this bond far more than it's affecting the short-term bond. So typically we say that look, if we believe in liquidity preference theory that uh, our yield curve should generally always be upward sloping. The next theory that we have explaining the yield curve is something called expectations theory. And expectations theory says that uh, the shape of the yield curve depends on investors' expectations about future inflation rates. So you can probably see why this is true. If investors believe that inflation is going to be very high in the future, aka prices of goods are going to be increasing in the future due to demand for those goods, typically we expect that there's going to be a, an upward sloping yield curve. So investors are going to demand higher interest rates in order to park their money in bonds that have a longer time to maturity. So uh, typically we say that investors' expectations on, uh, on inflation are driving a large portion of the yield curve or the, the difference in interest rates on that yield curve. Lastly, we have market segmentation theory. And market segmentation theory is this theory that says that every borrower and every lender has a preferred maturity and that the slope of the, the yield curve depends on the supply of and the demand for funds in long-term market relative to the short-term market. All right, that's a very long-winded definition uh, that your book gave you. Let's try and shorten it and get it a, a bit more concise and put it in the real world. Essentially, this theory, this market segmentation theory, says that if there are a lot of investors, or let's say every investor in the overall economy wants to achieve the same goal, let's say save for retirement that occurs in five years, in that case, the interest rate around that fifth year, of, or rather I should say, the interest rate that you could get as an investor on that, around that fifth year is going to be dependent on the demand for bonds that have a five-year maturity. In other words, if there's a large segment of the investing population that has a definite demand for, let's say, short-term bonds or long-term bonds, that's going to drive the, the look of our yield curve. So let's say there's a huge amount of demand for, uh, let's say, the one-month T-bill. Well, if there's a large amount of investors who want to own a one-month T-bill, there's a large amount of demand. And so what that does to interest rates is it actually pushes them down. The reason for this is because if you are deciding how much you demand in compensation for giving up your cash today in order to receive it, plus some compensation at the end of one month, and you're competing with a bunch of other investors who are also demanding uh, an asset that has a one month time to maturity, you're probably going to have to decrease the interest rate that you accept. So if you have enough investors who are interested in some asset with a specific time to maturity, chances are the interest rate on that, on that particular asset with that particular time to maturity is going to be driven down. And that's what market segmentation theory says. Uh, so typically, investors are more interested in short-term assets, and so the interest rates that they're willing to accept in order to give up their compensation today it are a little lower than the, the interest rates that they demand for longer-term assets, say like a 30-year T-bond or a 10-year T-note. All right, so one question that we might have now that we know the theories of why the yield curve looks the way it does is, does the yield curve actually predict future interest rates? And the short answer is, yeah, kind of. Uh, it does a pretty good job of predicting the interest rates or the short-term interest rates, say, between years three and four, or five and six, uh, given the information that we have. Uh, now, what we can actually do with our yield curve is if we assume that 
every asset has the same, well, let's say the same risk-free rate, the same real risk-free rate exists in the overall economy and our maturity risk premium is equal to zero, what we can do is we can take a look at the inflation expectations associated with our yield curve and we can actually predict future economic conditions with that, that information. So if we assume that our, mat our maturity risk premium in that we would have as a result of our yield curve is zero, what we're actually left with is the real risk-free rate plus our inflation expectations. In other words, we can actually calculate expected inflation over the next several years. Now, one thing we can also do is we can predict the annual yield in a period based on our expected inflation and the risk-free rate. So what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna show you how we do this, uh, how we do both of these things. So let's take a look at this example. In this example, we'll say that the real risk-free rate, R star, is 2%. And we have a couple of expectations about the future inflation rates in 2019, 2020, and 2021. Uh, specifically, we expect that the inflation rate in 2019 is going to be 2%. We have an expectation that the inflation rate in 2020 is 3%, and we have the expectation that the, infl the inflation rate in 2021 is going to be 4%. What we can do is we can actually calculate the overall in uh, the expected inflation rate over a longer time period by simply taking the average of or the average of our inflation rates over let's say one year or two years or three years and we get our overall inflation rate that we can combine with our risk, real risk free rate to get our nominal interest rate on each bond. So the way we do this is if let's say we have our expected annual inflation rate of 2% in 2019. Well, we can combine that 2% interest rate down here at the bottom with our real risk-free rate of 2% on a one-year T-bond. And our, that means that our nominal rate is going to be 4% on a one-year bond. Now, if we want to know what the nominal rate of, a, let's say, a two-year bond is going to be, if we have inflation expectations of 2% in 2019, so next year, and 3% in 2020, aka two years from now, what we can do is calculate the average inflation over that period, which is going to be 2% plus 3% divided by two, aka 2.5%. And we can add that 2.5% inflation expectation to our real risk-free rate. And that gives us a nominal rate for this two-year bond, or this bond with a two-year time to maturity of 4.5%. Finally, if we have an inflation expectation of 4% in 2021, we can calculate the expected inflation rate over the next three years by taking the average inflation over 2019, 2020, and 2021. And so what we have here is 2% plus 3% plus 4% and that quantity divided by three. And that gives us an expected inflation rate over January 1st of 2019 to December 31st of 2021 of 3%. So if we add this 3% inflation expectation to our real risk-free rate in the overall economy of 2%, this tells us that the nominal rate that we should be willing to pay for a bond with a three-year time to maturity is 5%. So if we were going to graph a yield curve just based on our in expected inflation rate and our real risk-free rate, what we would see is that this yield curve is actually an upward sloping yield curve. It actually is increasing. Now, one other thing that we can do is we can calculate the yield on an N-year bond as long as we know the yield on previous year bonds, on uh, the yield in previous years. And so there's a formula that we can use. Uh, so it's just the, it simply says that the yield on an N-year bond, say a bond at some point in the future, is equal to the average return over each year for that bond. 
So let's say that we have a bond here that has a uh, three year time to maturity. Now, what we can do is take the uh, yield on a one year bond, add in the yield on a bond that has a one year time to maturity but starting a year from now, and then add in the yield on a one year bond that uh, would be issued, let's say, two years from now and matures in three years from now, and take the average of those, and that's going to be, be the yield on our end year bond. Now, let's take a look at uh, an example here because I'm being a bit uh, loosey goosey with this. So let's say the yield on a one year T bill is 5%, and the yield on the two year T bill is 6%. Let's say we want to know what the expected in interest rate is going to be in year two. Well, if we know the yield on our two-year bond, aka 6%, and we know the yield on our one-year bond, which is 5%, we can use the formula that I just gave you to calculate the expected interest rate in year two. The reason for this is because all we have to do is just take the number of periods over which we have interest rates, aka two years, over to the other side, so we're going to multiply 6% uh, by 2 and get 12%. And then all we have to do to calculate the expected interest rate in year 2 is take 5% over to the other side. So uh, that's exactly what we're going to do. We're going to take our 12% minus our 5% interest rate on our one-year uh, T-bill. And we're going to uh, actually get a 7% interest rate or an expected interest rate of 7% in year two. So what this tells us is that if we have a yield curve that has, let's say, several different bonds, and we want to know the expected interest rate over a given period, let's say in just year two or just year three, we can actually uh, back that, that information out as long as we have the yields or the interest rates on all of the other years of, uh, for all of the other years. Now, I will say one thing. I don't normally do an example like this. Uh, your book is actually kind of simplifying this, this process. Uh, typically, we use something called geometric uh, yields or geometric average returns. Your book is using something called an arithmetic average return. And an arithmetic average return is just the sum of all of these returns divided by number of returns that we have. A geometric average return is a bit uh, different, but it's what your book uses in this formula. Uh, I will say this might be the only time that you have to use this formula. I mean, certainly in this class, but also in the real world, so I, I suppose it's fine, but usually there's a very slight difference in the yield when you use the arithmetic average formula versus the geometric average formula. It's not that, that crucial at this early introductory stage, but uh, if you do advance in finance, let's say you go on to, let's say, an investments class or an advanced securities and analysis class, that might actually be a bit of a, an issue, but that's all I have to say about that.